All right, we're back. Uh, I want to pass along a, a big, big uh, batch of gratitude to Alex. That was awesome. Um, your work is incredible, and we're really, really grateful that you joined us today and you were able to share that. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Andrew Jacobs. I'm the Senior Advancement Manager here at Halcyon. Um, if you don't know Halcyon, uh, you are learning about us today. Our main mission is to cultivate and support artists and entrepreneurs like Alex through two fellowship programs. Um, fellows represent everything uh, that we do. Um, as their practices have been upended by this crisis, we've been working day and night cross departmentally um, to ensure that they can continue to have access to their studios and their workspaces and resources. Um, and like many of the organizations that you're hearing from today, we are a 501c3 public charity. That means we rely entirely on donations from individuals like you to continue to support our fellows during a time like this and also in the future when we will crave to have intimate in-person connections to this incredible art. Um, we are keeping our minds focused right now on the short term and also that long term when we are able um, to resume these discussions and these conversations and these gatherings that we love to have. So if and only if you are in the place to do so, we ask that you please consider uh, passing the hat with a gift of any size to Halcyon. Through this event alone, this event alone, we have raised um, over $700 so far, um, which is amazing, and we are making progress. So please, every little bit helps. You can visit halcyonhouse.org slash donate. I'll put that in the chat for you all. Um, any point today or tomorrow or whenever, we really appreciate your support. Start your weekend with an incredibly good feed uh, and spread some good love and some good vibes. Um, and now, I'm super pleased to introduce Arlington Art Center's Blair Murphy and artist Olivia Tripp Morrow. Arlington Art Center is dedicated to enriching community life by connecting the public with contemporary art and artists through exhibitions, educational programs, and art residencies. They are located just outside DC in Arlington, Virginia, and is host to nine exhibition galleries, three classrooms, and studios for 12 resident artists. Thank you so much for joining us, Blair and Olivia. Are you with us? Uh, I'm here, yeah. Awesome, this take it away. Blair, and I think Olivia's here as well. Um, thanks so much, Andrew, for the introduction, and thanks to Halcyon for hosting. Um, this is a really challenging time for so many people in so many ways, and it's really great to be able to come together. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Just gonna double check. Can I get a thumbs up? We can hear you, Blair. Okay, fantastic, thank you. <laughs> um, so again, thanks to Halcyon for organizing. Thanks to Nicole and Aaron for all their hard work. Um, like Andrew said, I'm the curator of exhibitions at Arlington Arts Center. Uh, if you haven't been to AAC, we are in Arlington, Virginia, right by the Virginia Square Metro. I hope you're able to visit once we are able to reopen. Um, on site at AAC, we do have um, facilities for all of our programs, so exhibitions, education, and uh, studio space for up to 12 artists. Um, we're also a small nonprofit organization. Um, we have a great relationship with Arlington County. We're in a county and building, but we are also a small, uh, small nonprofit. Um, while we're closed to the public, we've been launching online programs to continue supporting our mission. Um, we've launched online classes and workshops. And through our Art in Context program, we're creating online programs related to our exhibitions and our residencies. So next week, we'll be hosting a live conversation with artist Rose Nessler, who was in our recent exhibition, Applied Forces. And the studio visit today with Olivia is part of AAC Off the Wall, which is a new series of conversations we're doing with our resident artists. Um, if you go to arlingtonartscenter.org, um, you'll find the first video in the series, which is with the artist uh, Navara Kami, one of our other residents. Um, you can go to our website or follow us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. To hear more about all of our online programs, we're also sending out a weekly newsletter that has updates every week with the new uh, new things we've put online. So please keep up with us uh, through those channels. And I'm happy to be here today with AAC resident artist Olivia Tripp Morrow. Olivia has been a long-term resident at AAC since 2018, and you may have seen her work at Arlington Arts Center or in other locations around the DC area at IA and at Hillier, Anacostia Arts Center, Brentwood Arts Exchange, DuPont Underground, and Smith and Murphy Healing and the Arts, just to name a few. Hi, Olivia, how are you doing today? Hey, Blair, I am good. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Um, so we were gonna start by talking about a couple sculptures that you were working on last fall. So 
sort of still work in progress, but something that's kind of still still developing. Um, these pieces were interesting to me because they really build on your previous work, but also kind of take it in a new direction. Um, you thought a lot in the last few years in your work about the body and working with uh, recycled wood and clothing. But can you talk a little bit about how those the new pieces build off the previous work and maybe kind of walk us over to show us the pieces too, if you can? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so a lot of these pieces um, are sort of, well, everything in here basically is in progress, to be quite honest. But um, let me just flip my camera around. So these are some um, sculptural kind of in-progress pieces that are made with wood, um, scrap wood, bound wood, pantyhose, um, covering them, uh, PVC pipe as well, also covered in pantyhose like this here, um, and rhinestones. <laughs> Um, there's also a few ceramic pieces in kind of in these, which we'll, we can come back to. Um, but one thing that I'm thinking about with these is the sort of precariousness of them. So I'm using as few screws and nails as possible. And a lot of the elements are actually just sort of balanced on top. Um, so like if I'm to remove something, it could, um, too quickly anyway, it could fall down, um, like that one. <laughs> So, which I really like actually. Um, so that's something that I was really drawn to with these. They started out um, as, I was hoping they would be pedestals for softer sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, and then I liked how they sort of referenced the body and their scale to me. They seemed really close to my size. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of in walking through them, um, I had to navigate uh, my body carefully, otherwise things would sort of fall down like they did a second ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, that tension too of the, the strength of the body, but then the precariousness of it and the vulnerability of it kind of seems like that it relates on that level as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, and, and from a, uh, a personal context of us, you know, having started these um, last fall, I also uh, was found out that I was going to need surgery and felt like my body was like falling apart. And so I think that in some ways these sort of came from that, but also still related back to old work. Um, and in terms of the materials as well, like I've got these sort of rhinestones just sort of like glued on top here. Um, and so they're covering holes in the, in the wood. Um, so this one, I haven't started getting rhinestones on yet, but you can see that they're sort of imperfect. And so I was sort of trying to like cover up their imperfections mm -hmm. and make them sort of prettier. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those kind of, you've worked before with those kinds of beauty products and in some cases clothing items, but uh, fake lashes, rhinestones, things that kind of are connected to um, sort of norm, gender norms and expectations around um, appearance. Yeah, absolutely. And um, actually just behind this one, um, this piece was uh, in the AAC show um, over under forward back with, um, so it's got the same, some of the same materials like rhinestones um, and like eyelashes. So sort of like beauty products like that um, or things that are meant to enhance bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of what I was, I think that sort of carried over into these sculptures where I'm, um, using these building materials to build a pedestal, but then enhancing them with these sort of um, decorative bits. Mm -hmm. um, and in some places, they're also uh, structural as well, mm -hmm. which is fun. Yeah, and you've talked before about when you started to move into sculpture and the, that there is a kind of map, like it, it tends to be a field that does have a associations in some ways with masculinity, with this sort of building and strength and um, that, that tension, I think, is interesting in your work. These use of, like, really feminine materials alongside these like, traditionally masculine structures. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, once I started getting into this, um, like, these sort of forms here, then I also was working with, like, stacking up these, uh, this wood that's completely covered in pantyhose to see how tall I could possibly make it. And so mm -hmm. um, this one is pretty short, 
but um, I've made them up extremely tall as well. Um, well, much taller than me, which I put something, it's not that tall, but um, so they really felt sort of like columns almost um, and architecturally, um, which is um, sort of a got a masculine tone to it normally um, with like a white column and sort of like strength and root strength and that sort of thing and then making it you know pretty with um, and and uh, covering it in pantyhose which is you know conventionally perhaps feminine and yeah yeah there's like an, ar an architectural feeling as well mm -hmm. you mentioned um, uh, and you you sort of brought up that you were making these in a period as you were sort of getting ready to undergo this pretty major physical transformation, um, which also impacted your work and how you were able to, to work in the studio. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the, um, let's see, in fall of last year, um, I found out that I needed surgery to stop the progression of my scoliosis, um, which is a curvature and twisting of the spine. And so um, I always, like my body always felt and looked kind of awkward to me. Um, and I, I knew that I had scoliosis my whole life, but then when I saw the x-rays, it was sort of like, okay, that explains a lot. Um, and that's sort of when I was thinking, like I, I started wanting to use my body more literally in my work. Um, and so while I had been referencing bodies and beauty and that sort of thing, um, I felt like I had this source of my own self that I could uh, work with. And so um, one way that I started um, sort of preparing for it, which was against the doctor's <laughs> orders, um, to not lift or bend, um, not lift heavy things or bend around too much, I actually started taking apart the sculptures and moving them from one room to another and recording the process of that. Um, and so as I would pick up the sculptures, they would, since they're just balanced um, from certain points up, they would sort of fall apart and I would be really pushing my body and um, like, and see what my body was capable of really. Um, so I have all of this footage of myself doing these um, sort of ridiculous tasks and um, pushing my body and then also sort of simple tasks as well um, like making my bed or getting dressed um, and I'm not totally sure what I'll do with all of that but that was one way that I prepared for this uh, surgery uh, mentally anyway beforehand just sort of like thinking about meditating on what the body can do what my body can do um, and how that would change. And the biggest change would be um, limitations and how I could move. So I can't um, bend uh, forward uh, or twist um, and still currently limited in how much I can lift for a little while longer. But um, yeah, I'm, this, this kind of thing is definitely going to continue to uh, affect my work. And it's, it's kind of cool because it's the first time that I've felt like I could use my own body in a way that um, didn't feel, uh, it felt like something that people could relate to, mm -hmm. um, but was also deeply personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've also been uh, posting to Instagram, so images of new work and kind of meditations on the whole process and images. So if anyone's interested, um, Olivia is also on Instagram, you can check that out. Um, she also did an Instagram takeover for AAC yesterday. Um, but you've also started, since the surgery in January, you've also just, you know, started creating new work um, and that's kind of taken a new direction, which I thought was really interesting. Um, sort of still uh, thinking about the body, but like you mentioned, like thinking more sort of specifically and, and personally. Um, we, I mentioned this to Olivia yesterday as we were preparing that I, when I was in grad school, did a lot of writing on sort of the body and my partner would give me a hard time, like the body, like whose body, like what is this thing, the body. And, so this transition of like, oh, it's this abstract concept, but it's also an actual experience that you're having. Um, but you, um, do you want to talk a little bit and maybe show some of the work you've been doing uh, since then? Yeah, so um, so since the surgery, since I, I haven't been able to come in um, to the studio, um, even before quarantine started, um, I was really kind of in bed a lot. Um, and so 
working really small was where I started and I got some embroidery materials from a family friend. Um, and so I started working with images of my body um, that I had taken um, post-surgery. Um, so I've got stuff like this. So I don't know if you can see that clearly, but yeah. so this is um, an, uh, from an image of my back after the surgery. So these are your shoulder blades. And then this is the scar. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also got a surgery, a video of the surgery, um, which I thought my surgeon would be more surprised at, but he was just like, yes, no problem. So anyway, um, this is a picture from the surgery of my spine exposed. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, and these are drawings, but then you're also working with embroidery into them. So they're drawings on fabric and then you're embroidering into them. Exactly, yeah. And those first two um, are mostly, there's like, I have this oil pastels that are for fabric that you iron into the fabric. I don't even know where I got them, but so I started with those and then um, have been using marker and pen as well. And I've got this really big one on this wall over here. So, try to hold still enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is an image of the there's two doc different doctor's hands, and then um, up here is a headlamp um, of the another doctor on the other side's head, and all the tools. And so the Im the image overall is a screenshot from the um, from the surgery, and um, it's drawn in and then embroidered to give it more texture. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is taking me absolutely forever. Um, I think it's like three weeks of embroidery probably so far and I've only gotten to the red stuff essentially mm -hmm. so yeah it's a time-consuming way of working absolutely mm -hmm. and but especially I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm, right yeah you mentioned too that this is your you essentially started like learning to embroider as part of this process right so it's a new media for you yeah, yeah, I had never done it before. Um, and it didn't, they didn't start out really all that pretty. Um, but yeah, and I've learned a couple of stitches, but I'm just totally making this up, honestly. Um, I've got like a back stitch here, which is cool. Um, but other than that, it's sort of one stitch at a time by hand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just say I'm really excited to eventually see these in person. But even on screen and the images you've sent, there's this sense of how much the embroidery adds to the the texture and the depth um, mm -hmm. and it has a sort of elegance along with the how visceral the images are. Yeah and that's something that I mean well maybe it's a little different for my mom because you know being her baby and all but you know for like people that um, know me and have seen me kind of through this sometimes seeing these images is sort of a lot mm -hmm. um, but I'm I think they also are, um, you know, and my mom specifically, she's an art therapist. So she's told me about this uh, uh, form of art called story cloths that exists in a lot of different cultures. But um, basically it's sharing a, a traumatic experience through um, embroidery and fabric that tells a personal story to help you um, sort of process uh, trauma. And so I feel like that's where these started. Mm -hmm. And um, now I've just got a ton of them and um, everything I do is sort of builds on what came before it, but I'm excited about these, um, even though they feel really different from, you know, the wood sculptures that mm -hmm. we talked about earlier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you've always sort of been working on sort of about the body in this very abstract way. And now it's become much more specific and personal and also working representationally too, which is very different. Um, how are you thinking about that transition, I guess, from that like very abstract to very representational ways of, of working? Yeah. Um, so I feel like when I'm in the middle of this sort of thing, it's, it's hard to exactly articulate, but I'm going to try. Um, so um, in thinking about how um, feminist artists have used their own bodies in, in work and in performance um, and photography and drawing and all of that, 
um, that's something that I never felt like um, really comfortable doing before. Um, but I think that, you know, as I said, when I saw the x-ray um, and how sort of like incredibly strange this experience, that experience was of seeing that, um, I wanted to, you know, like the, the spine itself looked like art to me. Like it looked like someone had drawn it um, uh, or taken a photo of it and altered it somehow. Um, so, yeah, you... that, oh, sorry. No. I was gonna say that tension, I think too, um, that there, there are all these, this whole history of feminist artists who've worked with the body and worked more personally with it, but there, it still feels like sometimes there's a kind of stigma or like feeling that if, if it's too personal, then it's somehow like self-indulgent in a way or sort of not taken as seriously. I think it's interesting to realize that that's still maybe an undercurrent or sort of, you know, think something that people do absorb still as artists. Um, and it also made me, when we were talking yesterday, we talked a little bit about the sculpture of pieces and this decorative element. And um, when we were working, when I was working on plans for Over Under Forward Back, the show you were in at AAC, I guess last year, um, reading about the history of you know, artists working with textiles in the 60s and 70s, and that one of the critiques of their work often, if they were, if they were in a show, the critic would look at it and say, oh, it's too decorative. Like this was sort of the code word for things that were not taken as seriously. So that, I don't know, those two, I guess that, that tension, I think, is something that's kind of always, you've been confronting in your work. Yeah, definitely. I think I've been, I've been feeling that as well. And honestly, just, I've, you know, in showing some of these, um, what started out as a lot smaller pieces, I don't know that I would have taken a leap into going a lot bigger with them if it wasn't for um, the artist friends that I showed that were like, these are great, you have to keep doing this. Um, because it did feel self-indulgent and like it was something, you know, personal as well. But, um, you know, the, the fact that someone who hasn't been through this exact experience but can still, um, you know, benefit from seeing it um, and makes you sort of think and reflect on, you know, maybe your own body or something that you've been through, um, you know, there's still value in it. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, I mean, I think even, you know, I was talking about it as sort of more representational, but they're also really beautifully, there is an abstraction to them that's really beautiful and this tension between the, the sort of beauty and the grotesque, which is also like a sort of long standing theme in a lot of, that a lot of artists have worked on. Like that, that, that line, I think, is really there viscerally in the, embroider, yeah. the new embroidery pieces. Definitely. Yeah, and I mean, I think also as sort of as a series like this blue one, I haven't started going in with embroidery yet to these, but um, I've been looking for fabric that sort of looks like um, the hospital uh, mm -hmm. gowns and, and fabric. And I've actually had the doctors um, send me images post-surgery of the, the different tools that they have and sort of thinking about like honestly if you look at the tools that they were using like 30 years ago they mm -hmm. and, and even longer back they haven't changed all that much um, mm -hmm. and they look sort of uh, like medieval some of them like the clamps and the like scissors and all those sorts of things so um, yeah one thing that I haven't done yet but that I'm interested in is actually trying to recreate some of those tools um, and I don't know, yeah. I think we, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so let me see, Sophia is asking um, if you think of the photos of your pre-surgery body themselves as works of art. Uh, do you mean the x-rays or, so? Sure. Yeah, so I, I did take, the reason I asked is I did take some photos beforehand um, of my body doing, like getting into various poses that I'll never get into again, where I'm like twisted and turned. And um, also I'm two inches taller now. So like, it's just a different uh, body. Um, and I don't know. I mean, that's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I think that if I, when I put them all together, um, sort of as like a montage, 
they there's a movement, a quality of movement to them that I'm really interested in. Um, so it might be sort of fuel for something down the road, like maybe they're not works yet, but they're, you're kind of spending some time, maybe eventually once you spend some time with them, they might turn, turn into something. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> exactly. And I have done some embroideries with the images. I haven't quite, I don't have them here, but um, I have been drawing with those images. So they look really strange to begin with. So then drawing them also takes it, abstracts it further since it's not exact. Um, so anyway. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we have one more question real quick. I think we're good on time. Um, how long does it take you to do these pieces? It's a perpetual uh -huh. fibers question. <laughs> um. Yeah, so it sort of depends. Like this big one, um, let's see, the just the red like embroidery in there probably is taking me two or three weeks. Um, and the whole thing maybe another week. So mm -hmm. it's pretty slow. Something like this took me about a week and then something like this was a couple of weeks. Um, so, and also when I started these smaller ones, I was earlier in my recovery, so I didn't have as much, um, like I can sit up for several hours now just fine, but when I was making these, I sort of had an hour at a time and then I had to lay down in an hour and lay down. So um, that slowed me down. Oh, um, someone's also asking if we can see some details closer to the camera. Yeah. Um, it might be about out of time, but maybe that real quick. So. so this is a really early one. I also think the back of these shows how like I had no idea what I was doing when I started. Um, and then as I get into these bigger ones, it's a lot. You can tell that they're kind of know what I'm doing a little bit more for here. I don't know if I'm holding that still enough. Yeah, that's great. Like I said, I am really excited to see these in person <laughs> at some point in the future and um, see them as they progress too. This is really new, new, um, yeah, pretty recent development in your work. Thanks. Yeah, they do better in person. Um, and also just the, I think as we talked about yesterday, the sort of depths of them, like the embroidery is on top and then underneath is oil pastel. And then on top of that is a layer of marker. And so there's this real depth to it that I think is hard to see with when you're not in person. Cool. Well, thanks, Olivia. This was really great. And I um, appreciate everybody's questions and everybody uh, yeah, being here to, to watch. And please, once, once we're able to reopen, please come to AAC. We do open studios at our exhibition openings. So when that happens again, um, you'll be able to come visit Olivia and her studio. So thanks again. And thanks, Halcyon. Thank you.